it's time to get spooky. <sighs> so I love Halloween. It's my favorite time of the year, when the days get colder, the nights come sooner, the giant skeleton decorations start showing up, and it seems appropriate to watch a crappy horror movie or two. Or in tonight's case, play some video games. Now, horror video games have been around since, well, when video games were in their infancy. A lot of people source Haunted House for the Magnavox Odyssey as the first horror game, but two pixels flying around the screen with a plastic TV overlay doesn't sound scary at all. Horror games have really come a long way over the years. From running around zombie-infested mansions in Resident Evil, to fog-ridden towns in Silent Hill, to spaceships full of monstrosities in Dead Space, and the occasional walking simulator trying to imitate games like Amnesia and failing miserably for that. Which is kind of the theme for tonight's episode. Games that just miss the mark on trying to scare us, shock us, or just being downright uncomfortable. Well, I was uncomfortable playing some of these games, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Today we're looking at some horror games that have a pretty bad reputation for being, well, shit. So I'm here to take a look at these games to see if there's anything, you know, redeemable about them. And to be honest, laugh at some pretty bad voice acting. Master, it's you. It's really you. Get up. It's not too bad, even as a prototype. Come on! My only criteria for this video is that these games had to be released on consoles because it would just be way too easy to pick out a game released on Steam with something reusing Unity assets or something like that. And I'm trying to keep these games somewhat retro, with most of these games being released over 20 years ago. With one exception, but we'll pass that news report once we get there. With all that out of the way, strap in folks, this is going to be a long one as we look at some bad horror games. God, this is going to suck. First game we're looking at uses a horror icon. The Prince of Darkness himself, Dracula. It's me, Dracula. Ah, 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 ah. So this guy has had his share of video games over the years. From inspiring games like the Castlevania series, to some really bad games that are based off of that one Francis Ford Coppola movie. Yeah, these games have not aged well, especially the Sega CD version with its horribly compressed cutscenes and its Mortal Kombat style graphics. But let's move on to the year 2000 with Dracula the Resurrection, a horror adventure game released for PCs around that time. But wait, didn't I just say no PC games? Well, this game also got a PS1 port that came out the next year, so uh, we'll be looking at that. How can I overpower the demons and rescue Mina? It won't be easy. I actually have a physical copy of this game, and to be honest, this cover art kinda sucks. It's just Dracula snarling at you, or maybe he's just giving you the snake eye. That's not a good sign. But what is kinda cool is that this game actually comes on two discs, which is something you normally wouldn't see with a game back then. It kinda gives the scale of grandness in a way, like you're going into a giant adventure that needs two discs. Or maybe this game just needed a second disc because they ran out of storage. That kind of ruins this. This game was developed by Index Plus, a company known for PC titles such as Crusader, Adventure Out of Time, and Operation Teddy Bear? This is really out of my wheelhouse here, folks. But they were known as one of France's biggest gaming developers. Well, before Mr. Ubisoft came in and ruined everything with Uplay. So yeah, this game was originally released in France in 1999, then it got translated to English in 2000 and got released everywhere else in the world, then it got ported to the PS1 in 2001. This isn't the last PS1 game released, not even by a long shot, but this is still a very late game released for this console. So Dracula the Resurrection is a loose sequel to the book, uh, Dracula. Bram Stoker's 1897 classic that's inspired many films and Twilight ripoffs to this day. Since this game is an adventure game and its story is the main focus here, let's break that down as we go through the game. So the game starts out with, well, the ending of the novel, where Jonathan Harker and his boy Quincy Morris attacks Dracula and his minions while they're pushing him back to his castle. 
They're doing this as a last ditch effort to save Jonathan's wife Mina, who was possessed by Dracula, so he can add another wife to his harem? Quincy doesn't make it, but they do kill Mr. Dracula as his body explodes. And, um, I know this is a nitpick, but Dracula's model just, like, fades away as an explosion PNG just plays right in front of him. It's kind of funny to see. The day is saved for now. The credits roll, and we can move on to the next game. Pretty short, not gonna lie, and, oh, no, there's more. Alright, let's keep going. We cut to seven years later as Jonathan receives a letter from Mina as she's once again summoned to Transylvania because she feels Dracula's presence there. Yeah, Dracky boy over here has telepathy powers in the book, so they use that here as well. Jonathan, fearing for Mina, runs back to Transylvania to save Mina from this old dude who just wants a harem. That's a really weird way to describe Dracula, but then again, this version of Dracula was always a hustler. The game doesn't do a good job explaining itself for people who haven't read the novel or watched any films about Dracula. It just kind of expects you to figure everything out, but for now the story is somewhat simple to understand. So Jonathan heads to Borgo's Path, a snowy area in Transylvania that's near Dracula's castle. And right off the bat we are into the gameplay here, and well, have you ever played Myst? You know, Myst. The 1993 adventure game that used pre-rendered backgrounds to tell a mysterious story surrounding an island? It pretty much changed not only adventure games at the time, but the entire game industry as well. And with that, it led to a lot of imitations, Dracula the Resurrection being no exception. Similar to Myst, you control Jonathan in the first person, walking around pre-rendered areas, somewhat slowly using items to solve puzzles. The only difference is that you can move all across the screen spinning around. It kind of reminds me, I guess to use a modern comparison, Street View from Google Maps if that makes sense. You spin around looking for places to go, items to grab, and puzzles to solve. The controls are relatively simple. All you need to do is look around, select items, and use the right item at the right place. That being said, if you're playing the PS1 port, be aware for the fact that you're gonna be using a controller for this. This game was clearly designed with a mouse in mind, and using a controller to spin you around is pretty clunky. This game is compatible with the PS1 mouse, but I don't have one of these. This port also has its share of problems outside of the controls. You see that book down there? Get used to seeing it. This is showing that the game is loading, and every time you go to a different screen or go into your item menu to grab something, it loads. It's not horrible, but say for example you're in a place and you have to use an item on something but you don't know which one it is, you're going to be jumping back and forth between the item menu and every single time there's going to be a load screen. That's just wonderful. Back to the game's plot. Jonathan goes into this inn in the middle of the woods to ask these, uh, what could be described as people? How he could get to Dracula's castle. I want to go to the castle. What is the shortest path? The two people you can talk to at this place is this old dude who just drinks a lot and can't really help you with much. I'm not the best person to help you. And this older woman who's basically telling you to go home. Stay here, don't go. For your mother's sake. But Jonathan being persistent convinces her otherwise. These talking head sequences only occur if you have certain items on you. And I should really mention the voice acting. It's certainly something. You must help me find another path to the castle. This is something you're going to be seeing a lot in this video. The old lady sounds fine, but Jonathan, the main character of this game, gives a performance about as wooden as plank. But it is very important for me to get to the castle immediately. But to be fair, this is still better than Keanu Reeves from Bram Stoker's Dracula. I know where the bastard sleeps. And, for some reason, this game really likes to use close-ups on characters' faces while they're speaking. This shows that the team who localized this game really did not give a shit about lip-syncing. It almost never matches up to what the characters are saying, which makes it absolutely hilarious. I have no choice. My wife's life depends on it. I must go. May God protect you on your mission. 
After looking around in the inn and getting lost trying to figure out where to go in the woods, you find a graveyard and you find this dragon ring thingy. This is probably the most useful item in the game, since there are a lot of items that have this ring shape, and if you use it, it opens doors. After that, we go near this house where this one asshole won't let you pass for whatever reason. So you distract the guy and you hit him in the head with this club you find, which probably kills him as he drowns. Damn, I didn't realize Jonathan's a fucking killer. But that's not the only guy he hurts, as there's this bridge that leads to the castle and of course there's someone blocking it. So Jonathan uses this flute, playing a recognizable song that all the locals know thanks to the old guy showing him. After he plays the song, he runs directly under this thing, and Jonathan takes advantage of the situation. Yeah, this guy is dead. Yes, he was one of Dracula's minions, so he would've killed Jonathan no matter what, but all you had to do was, like, move five feet to the side or something, then you wouldn't have been crushed. Anyways, we make it to the bridge, and of course, it breaks down when we're trying to cross it. So we gotta find another way around. The other way is playing that one minecart level of Donkey Kong Country. Just not as fun. Getting lost inside these caves trying to figure out where to go. With the PS1 port, it's made a little worse with the compression of the backgrounds. So if you're in a slightly dark place with very little details, it could be a little difficult to tell where to go. But luckily, this doesn't happen too often with this game at least. There's this one point where you're at an impasse where these bats come down and Jonathan just can't make it across no matter how hard he tries. So he throws this lantern down a pit which leads to an explosion? And he makes it out without a scratch on him. What the heck? After the minecart section, we finally see Dracula for the first time and not surprisingly, he has some of the best voice acting in the game. What greater pain could I possibly inflict on him than impede his quest when time is so precious? He's only here for a short time, telling his minions that everything is going according to plan. Damn, I guess Jonathan didn't kill these guys? But how did this guy survive? He should be dead. Now we're at the second half of the game, Dracula's Castle. Here, Jonathan runs into the scariest thing in the entire game. This creepy lady that's in a prison cell. Her name is Dorco, and she says that she can help find out where Mina is in the castle. All she needs is this amulet that could be found in there. Dorco can't walk into the castle for whatever reason, so not having any other options, we continue going into the castle helping Dorco. Just as a side note, the cutscenes with Dorco are the funniest cutscenes in the entire goddamn game. Not only do we have the janky character movement, not only do we have the extremely uncomfortable close-ups, but Dorko's voice acting. Don't argue! The Medal of the Dragon Brotherhood is the only way I know of to reach the crypt where your wife is being held. This is too goddamn cheesy. I fucking love this. So now we have the rest of the castle to look around for the amulet. You'll be running around a handful of rooms, but the ones you'll spend the most amount of time are is the bedroom and the library, solving some actually good puzzles. For a majority of the game, it's primarily use the right items to progress to the next room. But in the castle, and especially in the library, it requires you to look a little deeper, using stuff like a clock, shuffling around a bookshelf, finding coordinates on a map, spinning around this globe. It's basically using all the interactable things in the room to make it feel like you're solving one big puzzle. It's kinda cool, and it doesn't fall into nightmare logic. Things actually make sense here for what items to use. After solving a giant puzzle in the library, it opens a secret passage that leads to Jonathan going down into a cavern, and hey, it's the amulet. And oh shit, I'm gonna have to censor stuff. Come on, I just got monetized, guys. Don't take this away from me. These are Dracula's brides, which... Hang on. So in the book Dracula, Van Helsing actually kills these vampires, cuts off their heads, and throws them off a cliff. So these vampires are not supposed to be here. Then again, Dorco is not supposed to be here either since she was never in the novel to begin with, so fuck it, this game's doing its own thing. So how does Jonathan get out of this one? He's completely surrounded by three half-naked goth girls. 
Come to think of it, that doesn't sound too bad. But they're going to kill him, so he uses this obviously placed lever to put some sunlight into the room. Why is this part interactable? This doesn't add anything into the game and just makes me question why the fuck don't they kill me? So now we have the amulet, and we give it to Dorko, and hey, we actually see Mina here. Huh. So she wasn't going to betray us after all. But when Dracula comes back, I will have to prove to him that I can reign by his side as I did with his father. What better proof can I give him of my allegiance than delivering his enemy into his hands? Yeah, never mind. So she locks us into this room as she goes to get Dracula. Why wasn't he with her? Luckily, Dracula also likes to collect Galileo-style flying machines, and they escape the castle. Well, it's time to move on to the next part of the game with... Oh, the game is over? You mean to tell me that in Dracula the Resurrection, we don't face off against Dracula? Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah, they put a goddamn cliffhanger in this game. That's pretty ballsy. Obviously, there is a sequel, and we will look at that shortly. But imagine if this game didn't sell well, and it just ends here. That would have sucked for the people who played this game back in the day. But looking at this game on its own, Dracula the Resurrection is a decent adventure game. It's a pretty simple game that uses Myth's influence to make it feel more of a product of its time. And we can't forget about these cutscenes. Graphically, it is neat for the time to see a fully CGI video game, but obviously it has aged pretty badly, all things considered. Not horrible by a long shot. There were movies that came out around the same time that had worse CGI. Overall, you can do far worse when it comes to adventure games on the PC, and heck, even the PS1. Load times and slight compression aside, the PS1 port of the game is actually not that bad. I still wouldn't recommend playing the game with a controller, of course, but the option is there if you really want to play it. Stick with the Steam release if you want to play this game on a modern computer. But of course, that wasn't the full story here. A year after Dracula the Resurrection came out, we got Dracula 2, The Last Sanctuary. This game came out in 2001 for PCs and 2002 for the PS1. I'm very surprised this got ported to the PS1 since the PS2 was so dominant at the time. I know they were slowly phasing out the PS1, like they do with a bunch of other consoles and different console cycles, but it's still kind of weird to see this series of games make it onto the PS1 so late into its life. So Dracula the Resurrection sold surprisingly well, selling over 200,000 copies worldwide. Which is weird since adventure games were slowly dying by that time. Dracula 2 The Last Sanctuary was developed by Wanadu Edition. This company was the result of a merger between Index Plus and a company known as France Telecom Multimedia. They're now known as Orange SA, a French telecommunications company that's worth billions. I'm surprised a multi-billion dollar phone company wanted to get into the world of video games. This wouldn't be the first time I've heard this happen. But this merger lasted only a couple of years before Orange went back to doing what they're known for doing, and Index Plus was acquired by Microids, another French gaming company that makes games such as the Siberia series, and publishing a bunch of Smurfs games. Okay... So let's see if this is going to be a great start to a hopefully wonderful game studio or a complete dumpster fire of a game that just destroyed an entire game studio backed by a billion dollar corporation. I have a feeling it's going to be the second one. The game starts off with the ending of the previous game, where Jonathan and Mina are using the flying machine to escape Dracula's castle. We cut to Dracula planning out some schemes in England and we're introduced to this man named Hopkins. Wait, that's Renfield. A guy locked up in an insane asylum, he likes to eat bugs, he calls Dracula his master. Why did they change his name? So Mina's condition isn't getting any better. She's awake now, but the bite marks on her neck are still there, so Jonathan has to find a way to help her out. He tries to seek answers in a place called Carfax. This is the house that Dracula bought in the beginning of the novel, and the game just says, hey, we're going to Carfax now, without explaining its significance in the plot. So at first, everything seems pretty similar to what the first game had. Same kind of puzzles, same kind of exploration, and the same amount of loading screens. The only difference is that the game's backgrounds are a little more compressed in comparison to the first game. 
This isn't too bad right now, since this place is well lit, but this will be a problem much later in the game. So we look around Carfax, grabbing everything we see. Going through our item menu, we see a few additions to the gameplay. Jonathan now has a gun, which we can't really do anything with at the time. And if you select a book in your inventory, you can actually read it. There are a handful of books that give us clues as to what to do in certain puzzles, and the notes are fully voiced, which is pretty cool. These humans are decidedly useless. There's also some combinable items in the game, but you don't do this often, so these items are just here for show. But they show this off in the beginning of the game, where you have to use your matches on this candle that you grabbed to make this dark area light up. We continue in Carfax, trying to find the right key to open this room with a doll inside it, and then... Okay, what is this? Selecting the gun here does... Jack shit. But this does introduce us to the, uh, action sequences of this game. The red bar above you is a timer, and if you let it run out, then a JPEG of Dracula in a black background shows up, saying it's game over. Yeah, you can get game overs here, which is something you don't typically see in adventure games. I mean, unless they were made by Sierra, but uh, that's a different story. Instead of trying to figure out how to solve puzzles, you now have a timer in these scenes to give it more stakes. Make sure you save, because this won't be the first time you're seeing this here. Okay, so you don't shoot the monster, and instead shoot the door to move on to the next room, where you have to barricade the room with a single shelf so the monster won't come inside. Sure, that looks like it will hold it off. After pointing some mirrors together, you get some sunlight, and it kills the monsters. That leads to Jonathan running out of the room, taking a ride on the chandelier, which kills all the vampires. After that part, we make it through the house's basement, and... Oh no, sewer levels. Luckily, we're not in this place for too long, but this does show off two problems with the game. Thanks to the game's heavy compression, it's really hard to tell what's going on in these dark areas. And there are a lot of dark areas in this game. The other problem being how specific you have to be with your cursor, with looking around some things and selecting them. In this case, there's this manhole where you have to use to get out of this room. And instead of just simply looking up and going through the next room, you have to turn around and then look up as high as humanly possible to get out of this room. Like, goddamn, this game is fucking picky. Next we see Mina and Dr. Seward just relaxing at his house. Oh yeah, Dr. Seward is here now. He's one of the main side characters in the book, and once again, the game doesn't do a good job explaining who this character is. After a lengthy conversation with Seward, he does some hypnosis on Mina. He's coming to find me. I can hear voices. They'll make me go mad. Help me! Mina, you will sleep now. Sleep. Okay then. Seward sends us on a journey to find, well, more information on Dracula. So the same shit we've been doing before. We have to head to this graveyard, going through more sewers that are very hard to traverse. Moving on to the graveyard where you run into this guy who's one of Dracula's goons and... Prepare to die. Oh, but don't worry. I shall make sure it's slow and extremely painful. <laughs> What the fuck? I haven't really mentioned this yet, but the game's cutscenes are interesting for sure. They have the same uncanniness that the first game had, with bad voice acting and lip-syncing the boot. The only difference is that this game likes to use weird camera angles and effects to make things just seem more scary, but really it just makes things more goofy. Thanks to the power of crucifix technology and a fallen gravestone, Jonathan easily takes down this guy. Damn, I guess Jonathan can kill people. After dealing with this weirdo, we have to solve a puzzle including a compass and a telescope. That's just a little out of place in a setting like this graveyard, but let's continue. Looking around this graveyard, we have to open this door that might be where Dracula is. But thanks to these wolf statues, we knock out for whatever reason, and we wake up the next day. We head back to Seward's place, raided, with both him and Mina missing. They probably got kidnapped by this guy. So now we have to head to Dracula's castle to find them both. But before we leave, we have to ask a certain someone about Dracula, that being Renfield, I mean Hopkins, who's one of Seward's patients in his asylum. 
Oh yeah, Dr. Seward has an insane asylum right next to where he lives. That's an extreme case of working from home. We look around his office and we see the safe we have to open. And you have to use a stethoscope to crack the safe. And once again, the game is extremely picky on where you need to click so you can use the stethoscope. So we crack the safe, grabbing all of the items in the room, and we move on to the next room where, oh shit, there's a vampire. This guy was shown earlier being one of Seward's helpers, and I didn't really find anything interesting to talk about, but now he's a vampire, and thanks to the crucifix, we take this guy down. We also have to get his blood so we can make vampire venom? This puzzle is super simple, you just have to heat it up at the right level, and then boom, you have green liquid. And if you use it on the gun, it makes it radioactive. After finding the right key, we get to talking to Hopkins. And after some convincing, we get him to help us after giving him the dragon ring thingy from the first game. Considering we barely used it in this game, I think it's okay. So after giving him the paperweight, he gives us his glasses that have the secret visions of the vampires. Does it look like this? Before leaving Seward's, we get a phone call from Dracula just talking shit to us. You're nothing more than a rat lost in a labyrinth. I'll have you know that this game no longer amuses me. I- Silence! This is one of the funniest parts of the game so far. Alright, it's time to go back into the sewers. And what Hawkins meant by the visions of the vampires really just meant night vision. Which kind of makes sense, I guess, but why would he have it on his glasses? After shooting our vampire friend here with our radioactive gun and solving a few more puzzles, we make it to a... theater? We see this camera that we can use to watch a film where Dracula is taking Mina up these stairs. Wait, who filmed this for Dracula? Why would Dracula want to film something like this? None of these questions will be answered, so uh, let's just keep going. After doing another easy puzzle with this piano, Dracula kidnaps us, putting us in a familiar room in Dracula's castle from the first game. And even though he could easily kill us, he just laughs and fucks right off. He didn't even take my radioactive gun, I just... God, he's so fucking stupid. Turns out, the room that you're in isn't even the castle. It's just a set from the theater that you were in. I really don't understand this man's logic. He leaves us another one of his minions to kill, but after easily taking care of him, we still have one more guy to take care of. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you, Robo Dracula! Yeah, there's a fucking robot of Dracula that chases you down through the backstage area, being super menacing with his T-pose. Who the fuck came up with this? None of this is scary at all. It reminds me more of fucking Robocrabs from Spongebob. But it's also very frustrating once you go up into this area with a lot of dead ends for absolutely no reason, and it's pretty dark up here, so you'll be looking around like crazy trying to find the next item to use to move on. And it's on the ground, where you can't see it. God, this game. After destroying Mecha Dracula, God, that's a sentence I thought I would never say. We run back into the theater entrance, and we see Seward, who isn't looking that good. He tells us to go back to Carfax and destroy it, so Dracula will have no choice but to head back into his castle. So we give Seward our gun, and... <laughs> what the fuck? We head back to Carfax, destroying some things made of wood in a very particular order, which is super weird. You can only use this axe once, and you can't use it on anything else. Which is kind of weird, since you have to break down other wooden things, but let's just continue. Then you burn this fucker down, with Dracula coming in just to laugh at you and to lock off the one door you can use to escape. Oh no, how are we going to get out of this one? Do we use the key that's right next to the door so we can get out of the fucking room? Wow, that is just really fucking lazy game. These aren't puzzles, this is just here to pad the game. After more sewer bullshit, we head back into the asylum to make this thing, and we head to the graveyard to blow up these statues that were stopping us from going through the crypts from earlier in the game. We run into Dracula again, saying that there's no way for us to get Nina, not taking advantage of the fact that we're right there and he could easily kill Jonathan. God damn, he's so stupid. 
After that, we head back to the minecart level from the first game? Going a different direction, yes, but I don't know if you've noticed this yet, but Dracula 2 really likes to reuse stuff from the first game. And for the new places that we go to, the game reuses those areas as well. I'm pretty sure we've been to Seward's house like three or four times throughout this journey. This is just padding out the game, making it seem a lot longer than the first one, but really, it's just more busy work. Luckily, with the mines, we aren't here for too long, as we find some dynamite and blow up some rocks across a tunnel. Wouldn't this make, like, a cave-in or something? I don't know. This leads to... probably the most interesting looking place in the entire game. This place looks like some sort of ancient vampire tomb, with skeletons roaming all across it, having ancient architecture to look around to. And there's also a crossbow here for some reason. You know, something that could just kill vampires in a place where there used to be vampires. Uh... After going through the crypts, we end up going to a graveyard where we found the dragon ring thingy from the first game. Unfortunately, we can't go back to the bar and hang out with the old lady and the drunk dude. But we do use Hawkins glasses to do this thing with an invisible blast from a crucifix, which opens a door to... Dracula's castle? What? You mean to tell me we didn't have to go through a bunch of minecart bullshit to get to the castle in the first game? All we needed was some bolt cutters to open this gate and boom, you're there. I just fucking can't b Ah! Dracula, go get the heck out of here! I'm on 12 Vicodin smoking on Scooby-Doo dick. Okay. So, we're back in Dracula's castle, and look who we find there. Our creepy friend who loves to get too close to the camera. She had to go back to her cell because she failed to give Jonathan and Mina to Dracula in the last game. I mean, she did walk away from us, so that was kind of dumb on her part. If we give her this jewel thingy that we found back in Dracula's tomb, then she'll tell us that it could be used to defeat Dracula, and she could help us along the way when... Oh no, not Dorco. She was so trustworthy. Glad to see that Dracula's Brides came back. Now I have to censor things again. Alright, so this is the turning point in the game. Before you were going from place to place, sometimes the same repeating places over and over again, having puzzles that, at the very least, made some sort of sense. Not so much here. You have this chessboard puzzle, and you have a guide on how to do this. But you have to put these pieces in the opposite direction for what the guide tells you, just to throw you off. Then you have to walk around a giant chessboard, and if you walk in the wrong spot for whatever reason, boom, game over. There isn't even a funny cutscene here. Now they're just getting lazy. So after dumb guessing your way across the chessboard, you make it to a new part of the castle with this gondola thingy. And we meet our boy Hopkins on the other side. He's happy to show us our way to Dracula's lair when, oh uh, yeah, I forgot about Dracula's minions. And instead of Jonathan just moving away from the slow moving knife, Hopkins sacrifices himself. Man, a lot of people are dying towards the end of the game. So you think that would just like raise the tension or something, but I don't care about any of these people. Hopkins, in his dying words, gives us a key to Dracula's last sanctuary and tells us where it is. And then we just leave his body there. That's nice of us. We use the gondola to go up to the next area using these wooden planks, and... Where the fuck do I go? I'm trying to find this door in total darkness. That's just great design here, guys. Okay, so after opening the door, we have to run to the other side of this building in a timed event, or else Dracky Boy's minions are going to kill us. These timed events are pretty easy overall. They give you way too much time to really worry about dying. After pushing a stone head, or at least I think that's what that is, down the stairs, you have to go through a series of bullshit to get this cannon working, so you can get rid of this asshole and go across the broken bridge. And here, more of the same problems show up. Dark areas where you can't see shit and has important items in them, long load times picking out different items, areas that are very strict on which items you have to use, in this case having a particular order to put all the items inside this cannon, but it does lead to another funny cutscene. I like how none of these cutscenes have transitions in them. It just hard cuts back to gameplay, it's fucking hilarious. 
All right, we made it to the home stretch where we have to go down to this elevator and what the fuck am I supposed to do here? Jesus Christ, who play tested this and said, yeah, they can figure this out. I just had to take a look at the PC version of this game to see what the room looked like and yeah, this place is well lit. And it's pretty easy to figure out that you need a special key to move the elevator so you can move on to the next room. Here it's just darkness, 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 darkness. All right, we have the last few puzzles in the game. We have a staircase that if you go down immediately, you just fucking die without warning. Nice. You have to go down this thing based on the icons of the stairs, I think. Then you have this fire room and you have to pull these levers in a very particular order. And if you don't do it in time, then you're going to be seeing the Dracula JPEG a lot. I had to look up a guide here because I had no idea what I was doing. These last puzzles are very picky on what to do. Finally, we make it to Dracula, hanging out with his harem. I'm not even saying that as a joke anymore, that's basically what this is. Mina doesn't remember who you are, but if you have something to jog her memory, it might help. And it's her fucking wedding ring. Jonathan doesn't have a picture on him or something? Whatever, this works and now it's time for your epic boss battle with Dracula. Wait, it's just another one of these? Really? Okay, so if you just use the jewel thingy that Dorco told you to use earlier, then boom, Dracula's dead. Jonathan and Mina get the fuck out of there and that's the end, roll credits. Wait, the credits don't even roll. Are you fucking kidding me? They got that lazy with this game that the credits don't fucking roll. The first game even had this. How do you fuck this up? God damn, this game, this game fucking sucked. Even compared to the first game, which was at best a decent adventure game. This game takes a nosedive when it comes to quality with its overly ambitious action sequences, puzzles that just don't make any sense, and a story that's just fucking awful. But at least the cutscenes are hilarious, so there's something salvageable here. If you choose to play these games nowadays, do not play the PS1 ports. There is absolutely no reason to do this with all the problems I mentioned earlier. With the bad load times, the compression, the darkness, none of these problems are there on PC. But this still doesn't fix the shitty story and the really bad puzzles that are in this one. I would not recommend playing Dracula 2 no matter how you play it. Yes, it is hilarious at points, but following every stupid decision that Dracula makes, every dumb puzzle, and parts of the game where you have to be very specific on where you click on, it makes this game feel like an overall mess, and it's going to a place where it deserves to be. Okay, we're done talking about Dracula. The next few games we're looking at are going to be a little bit more traditional when it comes to horror games. For the fifth generation of gaming, there was one genre that became really popular for a time. That being survival horror games, and the series that really made it popular was Resident Evil. During the PS1's lifetime, there were a lot of imitations of Resident Evil that tried to do something a little different to stand out. And the next game we're talking about is universally known as a Resident Evil ripoff, and a bad one at that. I'm talking about Countdown Vampires. Now, I've only heard about this game thanks to an AVGN episode, and it didn't look that bad, all things considered. I know he likes to over-exaggerate on his reviews, so I figured, fuck it, I might as well play it for this video. And well, <laughs> yeah, there are a few things here that make this game pretty infamous. Let's start out with the developer. K2. This company is known for being a support studio for Capcom nowadays, making games like Resident Evil. But the very first game they made was Countdown Vampires, a Resident Evil ripoff. That's hilarious if you put any thought to that. Like, it's a studio who's known for ripping off Resident Evil, and now they're known for making Resident Evil games. The game industry is weird sometimes. K2 also made games like Tenku and the Valhalla Knight series of games, but they've been working with Capcom ever since the Resident Evil remake for the GameCube. Not much is known about the development for this game, but it did get released at the tail end of the PS1's life cycle, about three months from the launch of the PS2 in the US. Oh my god, does it really start up with a warning screen? <laughs> if this is a warning for anything, it should be to stop playing now. 
we might as well talk about the story first. But before we go further with the game, believe it or not, this game has a prequel comic. Yeah, this came out around the same time as the game, and it's probably just promotional material. I could not find scans of this comic online anywhere. I tried. It's not that expensive, but it wouldn't have been shipped here in time if I bought it. But yeah, this is a thing, and I'm probably not the best person to review comics. I'm not this guy. Okay, with that out of the way, let's break down the plot. You play as Keith Snyder, a detective who recently got demoted and placed as a security guard for a bunch of rich people, and they wanted to go to this fancy new horror-themed casino called the Desert Moon. What did Keith do to get demoted in the first place? He killed his partner. Wait, what? What kind of demotion is that? Maybe the special prequel comic can explain some things here, but alas, let's move on. The game opens up with a cutscene showing Keith doing security at the casino, and I guess this is a nightclub as well. This cutscene looks... dated. Obviously, I was too young to experience a nightclub in the 90s, but with the cheesy music, funny character designs, and the developers' names just, like, flying at you, it just looks goofy to me. A good chunk of these characters are only seen in this cutscene, so what's the point of focusing on this girl in the red dress, this old dude, this SWAT team, or even this cute little cat? But it's not all fun in games when a fire erupts. Luckily, the fire sprinklers come on, but there might be another problem. The water may have been laced with something that changes these dancers into lizard people? That doesn't look like a vampire. But they sure act like them, killing everyone in sight. As goofy as this cutscene is, it does have some somewhat decent CG for the PS1. I've seen far worse for this console. What follows is... Uh, a countdown. It's kind of funny how these are a staple in old Resident Evil games, but Countdown Vampires is like, hold my beer, I'm gonna do it at the start of the game, and the middle of the game, and the end of the game. There are a lot of countdowns here. Which, I mean, yeah, that does make sense, it's in the game's title. This countdown here is just to raise the tension of the room, and to be honest, there's not much going on here outside of the few enemies that are roaming around. Yes, you could pick up a piece of ammo, but then you move on to the next room, and that's it. And before you ask, yes, Keith is shirtless throughout the entire game, so uh, get used to seeing that tribal tattoo. After exploring the casino, you run into this woman named Misato. She just started her first day working at the casino. Wow, that's a shitty first day. But since she's new, she doesn't know a way out of the casino, and the security system has locked everyone in the building. That's just... great. So after running around the casino that's connected to an art gallery and a haunted house? Okay. You run into this guy who always points a gun at you every single time we see him. And their voice is just someone pitch shifting their voice and using the distortion effect. The countdown is beginning. Countdown? It's super easy to do this. <laughs> After solving a handful of puzzles and killing these... <clears throat> Vampires. You escape the desert moon as a self-destruction alert goes off. Yeah, this place can explode, and there's no explanation as to why a fucking casino has a self-destruction sequence. Next time I go to the Luxor, I'm going to ask if the place can self-destruct. That's the only way I'm going to find out why the heck this happens in the game. Next part of the game, they move out into the middle of nowhere in this kind of grungy diner, running around dealing with more monsters that look nothing like vampires which leads into an office building that looks like a lab of some sort. And you run into the spooky voice guy again, giving you more of a rundown of what's going on here. He talks about the prophecy of Gels? This guy looks like a reject from Organization 13 with headlights for eyes. Okay, so the prophecy is that the Moon Mistress, which in this case is Misato, meets Gels, a demon of some sort, on the last day of the century, then the moon will cover the world in total darkness. But that's impossible, at least I think. Even if there's a constant eclipse, it will only block off parts of the world from sunlight. The whole world can't experience a solar eclipse at the same time. At least, I think that's how that works. I might be a nerd, but astronomy is not my strong suit. Anyways, the only way to prevent the prophecy is to stop the rebirth of Gels. You know, this is near the end of the game, and they're dumping all of this now. They had all of this time to talk about it, but whatever, let's just get this over with. The rebirth of Gels really means deal with these witches who just want the world in total darkness. 
and your man with the funny voice comes out to save the day when... Well, he was fucking useless. So now it's up to Keith to take them down. And this game barely has any boss battles, which is fine, a game doesn't always need them, but these witches just teleport everywhere and they don't follow any pattern. And you have to fight them twice. And it's not like spaced out or anything. Like 10 minutes after the first boss battle, you fight them again. After many tries, since this boss is so inconsistent, we finally kill the witches, meaning Gels won't come back. And Misato comes out and says this. Misato, you mean you never heard of Gels? <laughs> Gels is the Emperor of Darkness. What? Keith, I'm just kidding. Well, that sucks. What the fuck kind of ending was that? This game's plot is a mess with half-baked ideas, things that are barely explained, and characters who are just, well, there for no reason. But wait, if you play the game for a second time, then you unlock a special story mode that gives you a few extra cutscenes, a boss battles with Gels himself being a giant red dragon person thingy, and a different ending showing off characters we've never seen before. Hey look, the man in black survived, somehow. Who is this person? Jules was right, you know. We're twins. No, seriously, who is this? Are you guys just gonna not explain it? Thank god we're done. This plot is really dumb and does a horrible job explaining what's going on in the world. Sure, it has some lore explaining why the casino is horror-themed and the test results of the white water turning people into vampires, but it still doesn't make up the fact that this plot is still shit. But that's enough about the plot. How does this game play? Well, the controls are like... well, I mean, just look at it. It pretty much copies the button layout of what a Resident Evil game was doing at the time. From tank controls, to having a button to press the aim which auto-locks onto enemies, having a dedicated map button, and hitting a combination of buttons to do a quick turn. The one major exception is that you don't press the triangle button to open up your item menu. You have to hit the start button, which yeah that makes sense, I'm just used to hitting the triangle button. So if you're used to tank controls, this game is not going to be that bad of a ride. For me, I think the game controls decently. It's aged, yes, but it's pretty much playable, which is surprising given this game's infamy. But that's about all the positives I'm going to give for this, because everything else in this game is just not good. First off, the enemy AI is either really dumb and just wanders around to random places, or a bunch of them can just gang up on you and throw you into a corner. You have no invincibility frames, so when this happens, you're fucked and they really like to place enemies right in front of a door when you're entering a room, so there's no time to avoid them. Speaking of enemies though, since this game is called Countdown Vampires, you're wondering why are there a bunch of zombies on screen? Those aren't zombies, those are vampires that act exactly like zombies. Yeah, I know it doesn't make sense. There is no reason why they're here aside from having bodies on screen when the rest of the enemies in the game are just dragon demons or something like that, and some of them shoot bubbles at you. FUCKING BUBBLES! The vampires seem out of place here in comparison to the rest of the game. And that's weird since vampire is in the fucking game's title! But dealing with all these enemies, you have to be well supplied. And luckily, this game has you covered with a lot of weapons. Way more than your average survival horror game. From a variety of pistols, a rifle, your shotgun, to a grenade launcher. And this game really likes to give out ammo. So much so that I ended up using my shotgun as my main way to kill enemies. Not the pistol, the shotgun. That's how much ammo I got to kill pretty much everything here. Add that with the game's bad AI, and this game is extremely easy to beat, with some exceptions. Mainly some of the bullshit enemy placement, and especially that boss battle with the witches. Other than that, this game is really easy. There is one way to make this game more difficult though if you want. At the beginning of the game, you're supplied with a gun that doesn't shoot bullets. It's more of a tranquilizer, if anything. After you shoot the vampires, you have to pour white water to turn them back to people. And this isn't as easy as it sounds. Since you have to stop in place to do it, and if there's another enemy right next to you, then they can cancel out on what you're doing. 
and you don't have a lot of time before the vampire could just like get back up and ruin your day. If you somehow successfully pull this off, you're rewarded with some money that could be used to play some games in the casino, like a slot machine or to play roulette. You could also buy health items in these vending machines that are spread out throughout the entire game sparingly. So you can use the tranquilizer gun on enemies with bad AI who can easily gang up on you if there's a crowd, or you could just shoot them with any of your other weapons. I chose the more reliable option. It feels like this mechanic was only tacked on to try to make the game more challenging, but it's pointless when you have better weapons in the game. Why would they do this? Another problem with the game is just the whole map. There are a lot of doors that need to be opened with keys, which is standard for survival horror games, but you have to run back and forth throughout the map. Sometimes multiple maps just to open one door, and once you kill all the enemies in an area, they rarely respawn, so you're just running around a lot of open hallways with nothing in them that just go on forever. But this world wouldn't be interesting without the graphics, and Countdown Vampires once again uses its influences by making all the backgrounds pre-rendered. There's a decent variety of places to go to, but everything here outside of the starting room showing the outright destruction of the vampires never really impressed me. It just looks somewhat standard in comparison to a bunch of other survival horror games. And some of the places look really out of place in comparison to the rest of the game. Once we jumped from the casino to the art museum, it looks almost nothing like the previous place we were at. And after that, we head to a haunted house that could have been a hotel to the casino, but we also have this grimy outside area that's only for a few screens. The art design in this game is so inconsistent. And then there's the music. No. This game's music puts the PS1 to shame. It sounds like an old Roland MIDI machine from the 1980s, not CD audio from the PS1. It really doesn't fit what's going on throughout the entire game. And of course, like a lot of other games at the time, the voice acting. Misato, I'm going to take a look up ahead. You stay here. I'm scared to be alone, Keith. Aside from the man in black, the rest of the voice cast sounds like they're recording their voices in someone's closet with a really bad microphone. They're not that bad, all things considered. Remember, video game voice acting is nowhere near the quality that it is today. Still though, the worst voice acting would probably go to Keith. What do you mean? Why are you asking about her? He just sounds super whiny, and it doesn't fit his character design at all. Overall, at the very least, this game plays surprisingly well, with controls that are pretty standard for the rest of the survival horror genre. But with the game's lackluster story, the difficulty being a non-issue, enemy AI that's just inconsistent at best and horrible at its worst, music that just sounds really bad, and the whole structure of the game is just running around from one side of the map to the other with extremely long hallways with nothing in them, I would not recommend playing this game. It has some good ideas and definitely has some potential for being decent, but there are so many glaring problems that just make this game unenjoyable to play. All right. Let's get off the PS1 and move on to a different console. The Dreamcast had its share of horror games. Ah, the Sega Dreamcast. Sega's last venture into the home console market. Unfortunately, this was a commercial failure for them. Sure, it had an amazing launch, bringing Sega out of obscurity in the West with the failure of the Sega Saturn here, but a little thing called the rest of the sixth generation of consoles came in, and it made this thing look super outdated with its lack of a DVD drive and a horrible piracy problem. In the console's short lifespan, we got some really great games though, from one of the first video games I ever played with Sonic Adventure, to a pretty decent variety of horror games, mostly from Capcom of course. You have Resident Evil Code Veronica, this somewhat forgotten game that was originally meant to be Resident Evil 3. I hope this game gets the remake treatment. We also got ports for Resident Evil 2 and 3, and Dino Crisis, which is basically Resident Evil but with dinosaurs. Well, before Resident Evil 6 did that. Holy fuck, shit, it's a dinosaur. We also have Ill Bleed. I know some people either love this game or hate it, so I'm not going to talk about this game in this video because I don't want an angry mob at my door. 
There's D2, that one survival horror Evil Dead game, Nightmare Creatures, Alone in the Dark. This console had a good share of horror, but in my research, there was one game that pretty much stood out from the rest. One that is universally considered to be one of the worst horror games on the platform. That being The Ring Terror's Realm. I had no idea what I was getting into playing this game, not realizing at first that this game is based off the Ring franchise. You know, the Ring, or Ringu if you live everywhere else in the world. This franchise first started off with a multiple book series by Kozi Suzuki, having a lot of movies, both in Japanese and English, inspired a lot of parodies, which is where I first learned about The Ring thanks to Scary Movie 3, and of course, they had to make some video games while the franchise was hot. There were two games based off the Ringu franchise, the Japanese-only Wonderswan game that was basically a visual novel, and of course, this game, The Ring Terror's Realm. This game was released in February of 2000 in Japan, probably as a tie-in for Ringu Zero, the prequel movie that came out in January of that year. But this game also got a Western release, coming out in September of 2000. I'll be honest, I'm still trying to figure out how this happened. Yes, I know it was a huge franchise at the time, having some of the highest grossing horror films in Japan, but in the US, unless you were into watching weird Japanese movies, no one else would know what a Ringu is, since the American remake of Ring would not come out until 2002. How did this game get a Western release? We'll probably never know. Alright, back on track here. This game was developed by Tycoon Corporation? Never heard of them before, and they only had three games credited to them, including this game, so clearly they didn't last that long. And this game was published by Amsky Ace Entertainment in Japan. They're most known for developing WWF No Mercy for the N64, and this game was published in the West by good old Infogrames. Starting up the game, we see a weird montage of things just happening. Virus, what? What are you talking about, Chief? The main menu has the sound effects that sound more appropriate in a cooking game. Alright, let's just start a new game. Oh god! Oh dear god! What, what the fuck? This right here is some of the most horrifying images you will see in the entire game. And these are supposed to be people! And the voice acting! So why don't we go out for a celebratory drink? Okay. No! No, I can't believe it's Robert! No! You okay, lady? Like, hey man, what's happening here? Now hold on a moment, sir. I know the two of them! They're friends! Okay! It's unlikely Carry to be a homicide now. case. So far, this is some of the worst voice acting we've seen in this entire video. Well, aside from this guy. I should make sure it's slow and extremely painful! <laughs> This is a good time to go through the game's story. So this game isn't really based off of any of the Ring movies, but rather the books. More specifically, the second and third book in the series. Taking elements like the cursed videotape morphing into a disease, and how Sadako's entity transformed into the digital world with a program called Loop. These are the only things that link Terror's Realm to the rest of the Ringu series. Everything else from the story is pretty much made up for the game. Speaking of which, the game starts up with... Whatever the hell that cutscene was, where our main character, Meg, is talking to her boyfriend, Robert, as she's starting her new job at the CDC tomorrow. Robert then messes around with his computer, when suddenly he dies in a very familiar way if you've ever seen the Ringu series. Meg heads over to Robert's, only to find him dead, as their friend Jack comes over to comfort her. We cut to the next day, where Meg is going to her new jobs, still trying to recover from her loss. Maybe she could find answers to Robert's death as well. But now it's time to start your first day at your new job, and... What kind of sad excuse for music is this? It sounds like someone using the most annoying setting on your Casio keyboards from the 80s, not the Sega Dreamcast. Anyways, Meg is now working at her now-dead boyfriend's office. Whose idea was that? And they're about to start their first day when suddenly she gets a phone call from Jack. He gives us a bit of an information dump, saying that Robert's death was very similar to two other deaths that happened around the same time. The only linking factor to these deaths is a program called Ring. All the other people were using it before they died, and the police tried to use it according to Jack, but it wouldn't boot for them. Jesus, have they ever heard of Task Manager? 
Anyways, Jack tells Meg not to use Robert's computer and just go on her day as normal. Also, Robert's computer is just like laying in her office now. I thought he died at home. How did this computer get here? Then of course, Meg starts using Robert's computer when the ring program immediately starts to turn on. Instead of just, I don't know, turning off the computer, she uses it and transitions into someplace else. It's kind of like a dark world where Meg is wearing a military outfit with goggles that are just clipping through her model. I think that might have to do with me emulating this game, but let's continue. She runs into a brigade member, and this guy is being somewhat vague and expects you to know that you're hunting monsters in this hellscape while also looking for someone. Meg, thinking that this ring program is just a game, goes along with this and kills this thing. Yeah, when I think of Ringu, I think of weird ape creatures. After taking care of that Thing, we talk to the soldier and faint, and then come back into the real world. Meg, still thinking that it was just some weird video game, doesn't think much of it, which is extremely weird. Last time I checked, video games don't make me want to knock out. And then Meg gets a phone call with the power turning off, and her computer types out something very familiar if you know the series, saying that she's going to die in seven days. But Meg just moves on, outright ignoring what just happened. Which is very counterintuitive to the rest of the book in the film series as well, when the main character pretty much panics once they get this phone call and immediately try to figure out what's going on to break the cycle. Meg just thinks this is a game. After walking out of her office, Meg is greeted by one of her new co-workers, Chris, as she guides her to her new boss, the chief of the CDC. The Chief explains that since there were three mysterious deaths and they're trying to figure out what caused it, they're performing an internal investigation and forcing the surrounding area for an evacuation and quarantining the CDC building. Wow, that's a shitty first day for Meg. After that, we're given a limited area to explore and to meet a handful of characters, including your neighbor Peter, a security guard named Lukito, and this old professor named Timothy. After going back into her office, Jack gives Meg a call and talks about the Ring program. Meg discounts the entire experience, saying that it was all just some weird game and that someone must have prank called her. Meg, are you fucking kidding me? Clearly something is up and you're completely discounting everything that's just happened. Jack insists that something weird is going on and tells her the news that Robert's body is in the hands of the CDC. This knocks some sense into Meg as she goes to the Chief to get some sort of answers. She mentions the ring program, and the chief just goes off on you, saying that you're wasting his precious time and that Meg is not sane. Yeah, this guy is not suspicious at all, and treats his employees with the utmost respect. What a piece of shit. Luckily, Meg has enough common sense to see that something is going on. After looking around the office, we go into the locker rooms where Meg wants to go into Robert's locker, but Lukito, kind of being an asshole, is not letting her see her dead boyfriend's stuff. But then old man Timothy comes in and tells Lukito off, letting Meg open Robert's locker to get a key for the restricted library. With the key, we go into the restricted place and we find a report talking about a story called the Ring Phenomena. This is a weird mashup between the events of the first film and book talking about the cursed videotape and the mysterious deaths associated with it. And of course, talking about Sadako, the girl who made the mysterious tape to begin with as a way of revenge for society making her an outcast with her psychic abilities, and also being at the bottom of a well for 30 years. They're trying to link the whole cursed videotape story with what's going on in the game, saying that the tape could cause some sort of smallpox disease. So to hopefully find more answers, Meg goes back into playing the Ring program, it becomes more clear that this dark world is more of an apocalyptic version of the CDC building. But we're not here for too long as we go back into the real world and get yelled at by the chief for going into the restricted library. But she's able to lie saying that she didn't know that the place was restricted, even though it's named the restricted library, and it somehow works. God, everyone is kind of dumb in this game. Walking out of the chief's office, Meg passes out and wakes up in the normal world with the power being out. She walks back to her office, seeing this mysterious figure, and pushes her down, accidentally leaving a keycard behind. With this keycard, you're able to go to the cafeteria area without Lukito stopping you for whatever reason. Wait, you need special access to get lunch in this building? What the fuck kind of place is this? 
Meg talks to more of her co-workers, with one of them having this weird haircut that looks like the same JPEG pasted on top of her head. And after exploring the rest of the floor, which is mainly empty rooms, she gets a phone call from someone being completely quiet. After that weirdness, Meg thinks it's a good idea to go back into the Ring game. Luckily, there's a computer downstairs that also happens to have the Ring program. And this is pretty much the format for the rest of the game, where you're jumping back and forth between the normal world and the apocalyptic world, to piece together what the heck is going on. In the apocalyptic world, Meg runs into the brigade member again, saying that there is going to be a gas leak and that only Meg can fix it by turning on the power. Unfortunately for Meg, the power key is in the hands of a giant ape thingy that she has to kill. What a weird excuse for a boss in this game. There's also a countdown going off at the same time. At least this game has one thing every survival horror game has. After turning on the power, we briefly see this little girl in the background, and Meg doesn't think much of it. Moving back to the real world, Meg runs into some familiar co-workers talking about this rumor they heard about some people being hospitalized in the basement of the CDC building. So after running downstairs to... Oh dear god, that sounds horrible. We actually run into some people who are pretty much accepting death. This is pretty damn depressing, as the people down here know they have the mysterious illness and are waiting for Sadako to show up. Looking around the place, we find an 8mm film. Oh uh, yeah, this was mentioned in a file somewhere that this film supposedly killed one of the security guards after watching it. That sounds familiar. We make it back to our office and we run into Lukito just hanging out there. He tells Meg to follow him because the chief wants her for whatever reason. Considering we don't really trust the chief and this security guard has just been kind of an ass the entire game, Meg runs off and leaves this fucker behind. After finding a key to the media room, we use this old projector and Meg decides to watch the 8mm film? Supposedly it has the answers to the mysterious illness, and it's just a direct clip from the movie! The cursed tape from all the movies to be exact. It's kind of compressed, which does make it a little bit scary in my opinion. Almost like you found an old clip on YouTube that you probably weren't supposed to see. Unironically, this is the scariest part of the game. Well, aside from the opening, of course. If you've never seen any of the movies, then this comes off as super weird and very out of context to whatever else is going on in the game. If you've seen the movies like me, then this is just shoehorning the cursed tape into the game. After that, we go back into the dark world and we run into Jack? I know the two of them! Yeah, that guy. He also claims that this is just a game and is about as dumb as Meg, not accepting that this might be a little more complicated than just a video game. With her friend now being in the game with her, Meg finally realizes that this world may not just be a video game after all. She faints, leaving Jack for dead probably. We never see Jack again by the way, so he's probably dead. We cut back to a hospital room where Peter and the Chief are doing some blood test on Meg to see if she has the virus. Outright confirming that yes, there is a virus going around and the CDC is trying to figure out a way to control it and maybe make a vaccine. With no confirmed way of infection, Meg suggests that the Ring program might have something to do with it. And of course, the Chief goes off on her. Which is extremely unprofessional. After the Chief tells you to fuck off, Meg goes back into her office, where Lakito is once again just chilling there, and he apologizes for the misunderstanding and reveals that he was once friends with Robert. This doesn't explain why this guy was a dick to us, but let's just continue on. He says that he wants to find out what happened to Robert as well, and if you find his body in the basement somewhere, he knows a way to get down there without people freaking out. Turning off the power to the entire building. That's not the most subtle way of doing things, but Meg goes along with it anyways. With some time to kill before Lukito turns out the power, Meg goes back into the ring program only to run into this little girl again just wandering around. And she runs into the brigade member again. Meg asks what's the goal of the game, and if there's an ending. Which confuses the brigade member and has me almost turning off the game. This guy pretty much spells out what's going on. Turns out both the brigade member and Meg are on a mission to enter a place called Loop and look for a vaccine from Sadako. So the world that Meg is in right now is the real world. A world where Sadako's virus has morphed into turning most of humanity into monsters 
which kind of explains the weird ape and wolf monsters we've been running into throughout the game. The Loop Program is a digital recreation of what the world was before the apocalypse, which explains why we've been running into two different versions of the same place. The Brigade member also explains that if you stay into the Loop Program for too long, then your memory will be a little messed up. So we're basically playing as a character who has amnesia in some weird way. This was definitely a twist. It is a little overly convoluted, but I did kind of see this coming because clearly there was something that was going to link both of these worlds together. This is kind of unique for a story, but I wish this game presented the twist a little better, making the main character just seem more interested in what's going on. Her entire world has been a fraud, but all she cares about is Robert, and that's it. We head back into the basement of this place and we run into the little girl again. And it's revealed that this is Shizuko Yamamura, the mother of Sadako. Wait, then why is she a ghost of a little girl? Turns out she's taking a form of a recreation of Sadako because she has psychic powers and I guess that's how that works. Shizuko explains to a confused Meg that yes, this is the real world and that Robert is alive here. Giving her more of a purpose to what's going on, Meg asks where Robert is, and it turns out he only has two days left before Sadako kills him, and the virus will also kill him. You see, this is what happens when you blend all the books together into one plot. It becomes way too goddamn convoluted for its own good. So Shizuko says that there is in fact a vaccine, but she's going to have to find it in Sadako's body in the loop world. So Meg is off to find the vaccine, but not before running into a room showing this. What? What's this? Sadako? Sadako? Is this you, Sadako? Holy shit, is that supposed to be Sadako? This is kind of scary and really stupid. <laughs> Alright, back into the loop world one last time, with Lukido turning off the power, but not before grabbing a gun that just materializes in her office. We make it back to the rooms where the virus patients are from earlier, and now they've turned into monsters. Meg isn't happy to be forced to kill something, which is very striking since we've been killing monsters throughout the entire game, and in this case, it's only a simulation. No one's really dying here. Shizuko even comes out and says, why are you panicking over this? This is fake. And Meg is like, no, this is a real person to me. And this is... fuck. This part was the most frustrating part to watch. How do we have a main character that's this dumb, not understanding what's going on when we have two different people telling her what's happening? I was already checked out before this scene, but now I just want this game to end. Luckily, we have one of the final areas in the game as we run back upstairs into the Chief's office, fighting now spawning monsters. Looking around his office, we move a bookshelf that leads into the secret room that's one step closer to Sadako. When suddenly the Chief comes out and talks about the virus. Just another effort, one more step and the work is over, I'll be the one who controls the virus. Virus, what? What are you talking about, Chief? Are you just... FUCK! The chief is saying that the virus could be used as a force for... something, before being turned into another one of the monsters we've seen throughout the entire game. Skipping ahead to the gameplay here, this is the most bullshit part of the game. He could only be harmed when he's in a certain position, even when you point your gun at point-blank range at him, and he can just run in front of you, lunging on top of you to drain your health. Fuck this part. Alright, the chief is now dead, and we go into the next room to see Sadako's corpse. Sadako looks nothing like she did in the movies. How do you fuck this up? Her look is so iconic and so simple to do. Her body clips through everything, flying to the roof, and that's where we head to next. Time for our final boss. And yes, this is way easier than the chief. After killing this virtual Sadako, she gives you the vaccine and... What? Huh? What? What? Why would Sadako... Even a virtual one be willing to give you the vaccine when she's been fighting you throughout the entire game. She hates humanity. That's why she's turned everyone into monsters in the real world. What does she have to gain from this? So after that stupid shit, Meg goes back into the real world with the vaccine, and she plays this radio, kind of explaining the aftermath of what happened. Turns out, due to a lack of supply of the vaccine, riots have emerged and now it's total chaos. 
I guess this is what Sadako wanted. Kind of a weird way to get around it, but hey, it works. And then the very last thing we see is Sadako just chilling in the background, looking at Meg. The end. Thank you, God, this game is over. Fuck this game. Honestly, in terms of video game plots, this has to be one of the worst ones I've ever seen for a commercially released game. What really kills it for me is the main character just being infuriating to follow. I was hoping at first that this game would use its license to tell an original story that kind of links up with the rest of the series. But instead, it just blends all of the books and movies together into this weird mess of a plot being overly convoluted in the end. I understand the whole ring and loop world thing, but what about the other people from loop using the ring program like Jack or Robert? Were they part of loop and they somehow got into the real world? Or were their memories also messed up because they were using loop too long? God damn, this doesn't make any sense. This game's plot almost broke me. So before I get any worse, let's move on to the gameplay to see if there's anything salvageable here. Well, it's a survival horror game, copying the controls of Resident Evil. Well, it's actually more behind what Resident Evil was doing at the time. Tank controls I can stand, but you don't have a quick rotate command, so you have to spin around slowly to get into the direction that you want. There are a few weapons in the game, and once you aim, you can auto-lock onto enemies when they're in your general vicinity. You get weapons like a pistol, a shotgun, and a rifle that I barely used. There's also supposed to be a katana and some sort of rocket launcher, but I never got those. I think you need to get these parts for the rocket launcher somewhere towards the end of the game, but for me, I was just running away from enemies or shooting the ones that were just right in front of me. The AI in this game is inconsistent, with monsters that are running straight towards you giving you no time to fight back, or can be really fucking stupid and walk away from you. Still not as bad as Countdown Vampire's AI. You'll be seeing a lot of these monsters in the apocalyptic world, and for the most part until the end of the game, it's pretty much the same three kind of monsters. Either this wolf thingy, these weird things on the ground, or these giant gorillas. And unfortunately, none of them are playing Feel Good Inc. Sometimes they hide into closets where you think there might be some items. This is just a sad attempt at a jump scare that comes off more annoying, if anything. While running around the apocalyptic world, you have a flashlight on at all times. You normally would not see this type of real-time lighting for games back then, so I will give this game credit for that. But once you find light switches for each room, then the flashlight ends up being kind of pointless. I didn't know the light switches were a thing until the end of the game, so yeah, I know I'm kind of a dumbass here. Graphically, this game is very... I guess the best way I could say it is plain. Since you're running around an office building, everything just looks like your standard, everyday corporate office building with the occasional labs and power rooms. Even the apocalyptic world just looks darker and a little more dingy. And that's about it. I do think it's interesting that you start off in the loop world at the top of the building, and in the real world you start off in the basement, once you explore both worlds properly to see if they connect in some way. But this also leads into another problem with the game. The map itself is pretty barren, aside from the occasional monsters coming around, and since you're going through the same map twice with little changes aside from it being darker, I guess, I don't really feel motivated to explore this place. There's nothing here that stands out and makes me go, oh I want to go inside there, or fuck that, I don't want to go there, that's scary. This is just a standard office building, with little in the way of art design or set decoration. The one thing that kind of stands out for this game, being a survival horror game, is that this game is fully 3D instead of using pre-rendered areas, which opens up some different possibilities on using different camera options to play this game. By default, you have the camera to be in a fixed area, very similar to other survival horror games, but you could have the camera follow you around in sort of a third-person mode, and you could also play this in first-person. Unfortunately, these modes kind of seem like an afterthought as the controls don't really accommodate for the different camera angles, especially once you're in the first person mode. This game ends up being a first person shooter with tank controls and no strafing. Not a good idea, but the attempt was made, which is a lot better than I could say about other parts of the game. Speaking of awful things though, the music. That really shitty song that plays at the beginning of the game doesn't stop until you move on to another floor of the building, or go into the apocalyptic world. In this place, the music seems more minimal and atmospheric, 
but really it's just the same boring droning music. And the basement of the loop world, we have the most annoying bit of music that just plays over and over again. Overall, even though I'm not musically inclined whatsoever, I'm pretty sure I can make better music than this. The gameplay is the most competent thing about this one, and even then, it's really nothing special. It plays like your average survival horror game that has slightly stiff controls, but having the auto lock makes it, at the very least, a little helpful. Having an abysmal plot with a main character that's just infuriating to be around, music that's just an embarrassment to all video game music, voice acting that's just awful, even for the time, this ends up being a really shitty excuse to use the ring license to make a video game. And I would show the bit where I throw this game into the trash, but this game goes for over $100 on eBay, so no, I'm not gonna waste $100 just for a funny joke. Fuck this game. Alright, let's get back into some familiar territory with the PS2. This console has its good share of horror games from Siren, Haunting Ground, Fatal Frame, and of course the mainstays in the genre. But sometimes you would see some companies just make one horror game and that's about it. Games like From Software's Kuon, Punchline's Rule of Rose, and the game we're going to be talking about today, Grasshopper Manufacturer's Michigan Report from Hell. When you think of Grasshopper, you think of games that Suda51 directed like No More Heroes, Killer7, and Lollipop Chainsaw. I'm actually playing No More Heroes 1 for the first time while writing the script, and it's awesome. Well, except driving Travis's bike all around town with the stiffest controls you can ever imagine. But we're not here to talk about that, we're here to talk about this game. <laughs> Alright, it's kind of impossible for me not to talk about this, so this game is more well known for its horrible voice acting. We came to rescue you! Can you hear me? Answer me! But there has to be more of a reason to play this game, right? So this game was sort of made as a bit of an afterthought for Grasshopper. So this is one of the few Grasshopper games that Gochi Suda did not direct. He came on as an uncredited producer and gave the basic concept of the game to Grasshopper and the publisher of the game, Spike. No, not Spike TV if anyone wants to watch an episode of A Thousand Ways to Die or reruns of MXC. Does anyone remember this channel? It's really fucking stupid and had the Game Awards for some reason. Anyways, Spike, the game company, was most known for developing games like some of the Fire Pro Wrestling games and the Dragon Ball Z Budokai Tenkaichi series. I remember having a lot of fun with these games as a kid. Michigan was made on sort of a lull time for Grasshopper, where they were taking up a lot of contact work to pay the bills so they could make the game Killer7, Michigan being one of these projects. Spike approached Grasshopper to publish whatever they were going to make, and what they came up was a concept from Suda51, a city being covered by a mysterious mist. Alliteration is fun. This is clearly taking inspiration from Stephen King's story, The Mist, where pretty much the exact same thing happens. Of course, this would be a smaller team working on this game, since most of Grasshopper's crew was working on Killer7. So basically, the B team made this game. Akira Yoeda was going to be the director of this project. He previously directed the Shining Souls games that Grasshopper made for the GBA, and he's credited for working sound on games like Final Fantasy IV, The Secret of Mana, and Mario RPG. Okay, so what went wrong? I've had it! Well, according to Mr. Suda51 himself, he says that the team may have been too inexperienced to tackle a game like this. He's publicly stated that he's not a fan of this game, and looking at the game, I'm not surprised. What kind of a way to die was that? So instead of having a rogue team of nobodies running around a city full of mists in an open world setting, they decided to cut down the concept to have individual levels, and instead of random people, we would be following a news team reporting on the monsters attacking the city and trying to find the answers to what's going on. Michigan was released in August of 2004 in Japan, and in Europe in September of 2005. This is where the infamous English dub originates from. Oh well, that monster's in heaven. I mean, hell. 
Apparently Suda51 had no idea this game was released outside of Japan. That's kind of hilarious. No! Keep away from me! You play as a cameraman for Zaka TV. Wait, out of all things to bring back in No More Heroes, they brought back this? I thought Suda51 didn't like this game. Anyways, it's your first day working at Zaka TV as a cameraman and an unknown miss is covering the city of Chicago as your team is there to report on it. Chicago, known for Deep Dish, The Bear, and Mysterious Mist. Sounds like a nice place to be. The reason why this game is called Michigan Report From Hell instead of Chicago is because the mist is supposedly coming from Lake Michigan. Your team is made up of your news reporter, which you can find many in the game, and the greatest sound guy in the business, Jean-Philippe Briscoe. You go through various levels, going through a news building, churches, warehouses, hospitals, and a hotel, slowly figuring out what's going on in Chicago. Not all of the plot is explained outright, and they have a few long stretches of dialogue that are basically plot dumps to fill the gaps in the story. These being the part where you have the chief of Zaka TV telling you that you have to report on the news no matter what, while a pissed off Briscoe is just scampering around like a four-year-old. Listen, chief! There's this doctor whose voice sounds surprisingly decent for a game full of bad voice acting. I see TV turns even the brains of those who appear on it to mush. He explains that the mist is actually a virus and the military, the government, and Zaka TV have something to do with covering up a plane crash that happened in Lake Michigan. Then he conveniently turns into a monster himself. The virus I created! It's now here! Okay, this part he sounds like shit. Towards the end of the game, you run into this guy. This guy is looking really sick. I bet he's infected with that virus. Who has the worst voice acting in the entire game, which is saying a lot. And he says that he's looking for the doctor you talked to earlier before turning into a monster himself, then exploding? After that, you guys go into an airport where you contact a helicopter and all you need to do is put a signal at a lighthouse and they'll come and pick you up. But before you go into the lighthouse, the reporter that you're with says that they're kind of tired and they say to continue going on without them. And so you just ditch them and Briscoe and you go up into the lighthouse when... Oh shit. Turns out your team was infected by the virus. Probably by this guy, or maybe it was just the mist itself. Not the way I was expecting it, but yeah, that's the end. I do think it's kind of bold for them to do this, but at the same time, it's kind of predictable since your reporter is not feeling well right before this happens. Plus, once again, that voice acting. I'm not feeling very good all of a sudden. It can't be! But that's the story. What about the gameplay? Well, it's interesting, but very minimal. Since you're a cameraman, you're going to be filming a lot of things, and the controls have your standard first-person shooter controls, except you're not going to be shooting any weapons in this game. Your job is to be a good cameraman, filming everything while running around with your team. You also have the ability to ram things, and the game rarely uses this to open doors or, in one case, open a box here. You also have the option to ram into your crew, and it's pretty damn funny. <laughs> Hey, you idiot! The bar on the top of the screen shows how many points are being put into different categories. Suspense, erotic, and immoral. Depending on what kind of points you want to focus on, you'll get a different ending for the game. It's... Suspense is covering things like a normal news cameraman, keeping the reporter in center frame, showing whatever shocking items there happen to be in the game, and not really focusing on anything else. Erotic is just being an outright perv, primarily pointing the camera at the reporter's breasts and butt. 
it's super easy to do this, but I don't want to get this video demonetized, so let's move on. And immoral points are earned in a handful of ways. There are various points in the game where your reporter is put into danger, and if you don't help them, they're dead throughout the rest of the game. The only reporter you can't save is Pamela, but more on her in a bit. You can also gain immoral points from liberally ramming into everyone. But the quickest way to raise that immoral bar is to choose whether or not to film certain things. At the game's opening cutscene, it says that you're going to be making choices, and this is what they mean. These don't happen often, but it's basically letting whoever on screen live or die. Or in one case, to stop filming someone getting eaten. With the power of save states, I did see what happens if you choose to continue filming, and as gruesome as this is, once again, the voice acting makes this absolutely hilarious. Run! What? Is that any way to talk to me? Behind you! Quick! What? What? <laughs> Other than the gauge, you do have other ways to interact with the world around you. Sometimes you need to guide your reporters to pick up items or open doors for you. You can also have the reporter shoot monsters for you. You just point the camera on the monster you want to shoot, and the reporter will take care of them. Not the most graceful way of doing things, but they had to put action sequences in this game somehow. You do have the rare boss battle, like the one where the doctor turns into this thing with giant lips. And if you're in a certain position, it can't hurt you. Or at this part, where you don't shoot the monster directly, but instead shoot gas behind the monster, then shoot it. Yes, these are extremely basic encounters, but it's better than running around empty areas. Some of these levels overstay their welcome, with long sections of running around with not much to do. The worst level for this has to be the train station level, when you're running around this empty area with not much to interact with outside of the basic boss battle in the end. This is where the game really slows down, and the bad voice acting doesn't save this part. So that's the basic story and gameplay out of the way, but I want to break down the main characters you interact with in this game. First, let's cover the reporters since we have a wide variety of them, and depending on your actions, you'll only see a few throughout the game. The first being Pamela, who's basically the tutorial reporter. She's Zaka TV's top reporter, and she only shows up as a human in the first level, before... I'm joining up with some other team. Uh, what? Just keep quiet. Behind you! There's a... M -m 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 and stop thinking you can order me Monster! around! Huh? Her death looms all across the game, not just with a certain character we'll talk about later, but we do run into Pamela in a monster form throughout the game as a sort of recurring villain. So after all that, we have our next reporter, Anne Anderson. She's a little less full of herself in comparison to Pamela, and really takes her job seriously. We're a news team, aren't we? We've got to be prepared for things like this. This woman's got a in her veins. Depending on your actions, you could have Anne throughout the rest of the game. But I did play through this game twice because it's not that long, so on my second playthrough, I did let Anne die to see the rest of the reporters. Next up, we have Carly Reese, a reporter who seems a little more compassionate in comparison to the rest of the reporters. Then we meet Justine Rhodes, who is somewhat unique since we run into them earlier and she's tied up for some reason. The game never explains as to why. We also run into her at the Zaka TV headquarters. And after one quick monster encounter, there goes Justine. Justine! Oh my god! Paula Orden is next, and she's more of a newer reporter. And you can tell this with her not being so eloquent with her words. Our news team went to, um, Club Gochi. The final reporter we run into is Mark Bockwinkle. He's pretty much no-nonsense as well, and doesn't have too much of a character outside of him trying to find his partner, Nina, which... Huh. We actually do run into someone named Nina. In the middle of the game, we get separated from our reporter, and we run into a cabin in the woods meeting Nina. She's looking for someone named Dwight, so not the same Nina Mark was talking about. Nina's special because she's the only person who joins our team who's not part of any news organization. She's only here briefly, too. There's this boss battle with this giant red thing with a mouth. And whether you kill it or not, Nina dies no matter what. So that's all of the reporters out of the way, but there's one more character that needs to be talked about. That being Briscoe. 
Briscoe is like... I guess the best comparison to him would be Tommy Wiseau, if anyone has ever seen the movie The Room. <laughs> that unpredictable, outright weird, and oddly serious at times character that's just perplexing to watch, but I can't look away. One of the best examples is where he screams at the top of his lungs finding a dead body. And then the next thing he says is, You better be getting this on tape. What? Every single time a reporter dies, he loves to scream their name. <laughs> Aside from screaming, Briscoe really likes to let everyone know how he feels about certain things. I feel a little dizzy. Right after the sequence where Pamela dies, Briscoe gets drunk and his dialogue is just fucking amazing. Oh, and I just let Pamela die. My only issue with Briscoe is, well, why is he here? What I mean by that is, if you know anything about news crews, then normally you wouldn't be having a boom operator do sound. The news reporter is holding a microphone. It would just be inefficient to have a sound guy there. Whether it makes sense to have him or not, I love having Briscoe in this game. His performance saves this game from being an extremely bad train wreck to an extremely hilarious train wreck. Look, she's smiling, you know? She always looked her best when she was smiling. Pamela. Pamela. God damn it! I had to do some digging to find out who voices Briscoe, and it's a guy by the name of Greg Irwin. He's more known for making Japanese children's music, and he has a handful of acting appearances. His only other video game credit is being the narrator for Street Fighter Alpha 3. It's showtime! I would not blame the voice actors themselves for how the game turned out. That would be more in line for the people who localized the script. That being said, thank you Mr. Irwin for your performance. Mayor screams of oh my god rain in internet memes for all eternity. Oh my god! Graphically, this game is not horrible, but everything just kind of looks the same with its extremely dingy surroundings, and the mist definitely doesn't help with that. The music is very minimal, but this one song keeps coming up whenever someone is about to die, or whenever Pamela's monster shows up. It's the one track of the game that stands out, and since they use it a lot, it overstays its welcome. Would I recommend playing this game? Well, it really depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for a game with deep gameplay, an interesting story, or in this episode's case, something scary, you're not gonna find that here. If you're looking for something that's absolutely hilarious and can stand the minimal gameplay for more funny voice acting, then yeah, I would recommend this game. It makes for some really good content to watch a Let's Play or watch a Twitch stream of. That being said, if you're interested in playing this game, emulate it. Unless you want to spend over $500 for a physical copy of an almost 20 year old PS2 game that's basically a meme. God, the secondhand video game market is fucking broken. <laughs> Three of the games I've looked at today are over $100, and there's no reason you should ever spend that much money for older video games unless you're a collector. I used to believe that the only way to play these games had to be on original hardware, but I got bills, games can be expensive, and Grasshopper is not re-releasing this game anytime soon, so go on whatever ROM site you want and have a good time, if you're in the right mood of course. We went through a lot of stuff today, with robotic versions of Dracula, guys in black suits with voice changers, a lot of really dumb characters, and of course, some really bad voice acting. If I had to pick a game that was mechanically the best, I would say that would be Countdown Vampires. The games that I had the least amount of fun playing would be either Dracula 2 or The Ring game. And of course, the game I had the most amount of fun with overall, no matter how minimal the gameplay was, was going to be Michigan. It was fun to see some attempts at horror, even if none of these games were scary at all. At the very least, they were interesting. There was a lot to talk about. And if you made this far into this video, thank you very much. I hope to God this video comes out on time. 
If you guys have any other suggestions for horror games, please leave it in the comments below. I'd love to read them. And of course, like the video and subscribe. Thank you all for watching, stay safe, and have a good night.